Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. That's me. Yep. Last week, uh, you, well, yeah, last week you heard me and Miss Berlin talking to uh, Omer about uh, Kubernetes security. So that was that was quite interesting. And this week we have Mr. Betcher and Miss Berlin is, what did she say? She was, she was driving or something. So um, she's not going to join us this week. Um, she's, you know, getting ready to do stuff and uh, hang out with family. So we're going to let her have that. Uh, <clears throat> so how you been this week, Mr. Betcher? Oh, I, it's same old rough week. And then, um, weekend working at the house, yeah. getting stuff together and then soccer dad with the kids. So yeah, just wow. busy. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's a good thing. Yeah. At least it's not boring. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, so before we get started, uh, just going to mention InfoSec Campout. We're going to do a conference here in the Seattle area, August 23rd through the 25th. So if you're interested and you want to do some camping here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there will, there are tickets that will be available uh, coming up shortly. We are trying to do a call for papers, so we're looking for three or four speakers to uh, you know speak at our conference. So you'll be able to come and, you know, possibly camp if you wanted to uh the conference is only a one day conference but if you're if you're interested you can uh, reach out to us on uh, our breaksec po- um breaksec twitter or you can uh, email bds.podcast at gmail.com and we'll uh we'll, we'll get you some instructions on how to submit your cfp so <clears throat> mr betcher wants to do it but unfortunately it's a bit of a drive for him yeah it'll take a couple days to get there yeah you, you could just fly you know uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's okay. You're not a, you're not a flyer so much. So, um, all right. So let's see. Uh, oh yes. Uh, things I learned this week. So, uh, for those of you who've been following over the last few weeks, uh, I've been doing a lot more IC at my office, uh, individual contributor, and one of those things was uh, attempting to do pen test of a uh, a customer environment, and uh, you know, I was. Learning things that, you know, I don't normally do or have ever done before. And one of those was uh, dumping credentials on a, on a device without using Mimikatz or Meterpreter uh, in what? this case. It is possible. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, okay. So here, one question I've got. You, so you don't, you didn't have system. We were, me and Mr. Betcher were chatting back and forth for the show and you said you weren't able to dump those without system privs. Correct. Now, why is why now these we... are the ones in the registry, uh, Sam Security and System. Yeah, yeah, those were the ones that I was able to to dump, but without system privs. So um, I don't know how you did it. I don't know either. Maybe I didn't do it right, and it just said, "Yeah, you're good to go." Because <laughs> I didn't get a, I didn't get a, "Hey, you know, you're not allowed to" or anything like that. So. Uh, let me see the SAM security and system hives in windows. Uh, the SAM hive is the one that, uh, controls or has a security accounts manager and it holds all the users passwords. Why they would stick those inside of a registry. I don't know, but they are, they are cryptographically, you know, uh, they are hashed and they are, um, they, you know, they takes a while to crack once you, once you've dumped them. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, got new headphones. So I'm you know, having to deal with the, the new sounds in my head here. So <clears throat> yeah, once you dump those, uh, those should be one of the first things you do once you've gained, you know, system or what have you to the, to the environment. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was an, it, it was an interesting engagement. We've uh, finished with the, uh, you know, the, the engagement. So we're, we're writing up the report now, but, um, there was a lot of different ways that we, we were able to, to get on the system. Uh, you know, we were using, uh, like dollar C dollar sign for admin shares. Um, we, one of the things was we, we had to do a phishing exercise and we found a user, uh, the, one of the user creds that got 
fished because we were actually able to successfully fish someone uh was uh able he had log in local admin to a lot of boxes on his environment so once we did a who am i slash group for the user that was logged in um you know, we found all these additional groups that he was involved with, and then it was just a matter of, of escalating privileges on the box. So we used PS Exec, which was on the on the network. We found it in a network share on the on the network, so we were able to escalate the system at that point. That may have been, you know, now that I think about it, that may have been after, you know, when I started dumping creds on the box. So that may have been the case when I had system. So. Right. Um, yeah, you can't get that with, with admin. There's a lot of stuff you can't do with administrator you would think you could do anything but yeah not so much yeah so we're we're still cracking on the the passwords but we're not sure uh we're not sure we're going to get anything uh the last thing that i i remember uh yeah i think we're using hashcat oh my god i had such a hell of a time with that um so i have a debian box right over here to my right in my lab, quote unquote, and it was running Debian and I had all the open CL drivers and everything in and, uh, you know, trying to get CUDA to work with the GPU that I've got because I looked at the spec sheet and my graphics card supports CUDA supposedly. Uh, later I found out that it doesn't actually support CUDA because Hashcat doesn't use CUDA, it uses OpenCL, which is an entirely different system. Found that out from uh, Chicken Man. Hey, Chicken Man, thanks for uh, thanks for the advice. Thanks for the help. Uh, he reached out from Austin. He's one of uh, one of the people on the uh, the Hashcat team. So, uh, big, big big props and help to him. I did a lot of uh, work before I asked the question, but yeah, my my Quattro K six twenty, which is about five years old, supports CUDA, but just not the right kind. So, I have to go get a, like a GTX ten fifty for one hundred and thirty bucks or something if I want to crack real real accounts. Otherwise, I have to use CPU emulation and it's. So it's quite a bit slower. So, yeah, well, you know, quite a bit slower. I'm saying, well, I was using Hashcat and John, the Ripper Jumbo, and each CPU was still cracking about 10,000 10, hashes per second, so times 12, so it was 120,000 hashes per second, thereabouts. So it wasn't awful, especially when I was cracking shell ones. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, you know, was busy cracking passwords on my own system and I could hear the, the, the fan shooting up. So, um, very interesting fun. I, I, I get it now, you know, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of pen testing in my, in my career. So, um, being, you know, individual contributor on this engagement and doing the, the pen testing and the red teaming from a, from a network perspective, um, you know, you teach it, you know, like I did, I've done 504 and they're like, Oh, here's the commands, you know, everything. Doing it under a deadline with um, people just, you know, hoping for you to, to gain access to whatever it is you need to gain access to. It was, it was kind of thrilling. I definitely got the, the thrill of, of the hunt, if you will. So, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, working under pressure is a whole different ball game. Yeah, and you know, yeah. w watching that, watching that enter button and waiting for you know, oh, you've dumped the creds. You're like, yes, yes, I was able to do that. Um, you you definitely get the the thrill of of accomplishment in that case. So, um, yeah. The only downside is now I have to write the report. So I'm I'm doing the boring shit this week. So um, writing the report, how we got in. Uh, screenshots, lots of screenshots. So, um, I'm, I'm, I, my, my, some of my testers aren't a fan of screenshots, but I don't think you can take enough in my, in my opinion. So, um, all right. So, um, oh yeah. One of the other things we used was something called, uh, power, was it power manage power manager, I think was called. And the idea there was it, that it would, uh, uh, attempt to modify the LSAS, which is a process in Microsoft Windows, to enforce security policy on the system. Um, but the uh, the other thing is that if people have logged into those boxes that you're remoting to and uh, they're using them, then you could pull the memory or pull the, the passwords out of memory. Um, similar to like how Mimikatz works where you can pull them out of memory. Uh, we use something called Power Manager. It was in Python. And yep. So there was there was some restrictions on the systems. We had issues installing software. 
and uh, even things like Python, you can use the MSI or the EXE. So I had to find the embeddable zip file so that we could run Python that way. So there's some nice and interesting uh, restrictions in place on that on the system that allowed us to uh, that we had to figure out and think creatively to get around. So that that was that was fun. So so there's a <clears throat> there is a Python, I guess. Uh, um, zip file that allows you to run Python where Python's not installed? Yeah. Yeah, let me go find okay. it. So it's like a, a container almost, right? It, uh, I've seen this where malware is written in Java, uh -huh. and then they have to upload the Java virtual machine yeah. self-contained environment in order uh -huh. to run their malware. Yeah. Um, they call it, it's it's new with version 3.5. It's called the embeddable package. So if you go to python.org, uh, they have the embedded distribution as a zip file containing a minimal Python environment. It's intended to act as part of another application rather than being direct, directly accessed by end users. So it says when it's extracted, it's almost fully isolated from the user's system, including environment variables, system registry settings, and installed packages. Standard library is, is included as a pre-compiled and optimized PyC file in a zip. So Python DLL, Python 3.DLL, Python 3.7.DLL, Python.exe, and Python W.exe are all provided. So um, it's not, f let me see, it says Tickle and TK, uh, all dependents such as idle, pip, and the Python documentation are not included. So this is like a very basic Python environment and uh, yeah, when we would try to install anything, we didn't have administrator rights on those boxes, but when you had the, your minimal Python environment, you were still able to run Python commands and, and um, unzip other, other system uh, or other programs like uh, Power Manager or whatever to, to be able to make changes to or to checks, make checks on the environment. So that was um, that was something I learned about as well. You don't have to install a full Python environment. That This is a nice small little version in Python 3. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. So well, some of the other things. Kerber roasting, we tried some of that and it didn't work so well. That's where you use Kerberos ticket granting system tickets uh, to be able to um, you know, make changes to the environment. Uh, you can request service tickets and return crackable ticket hashes. That's right. Um, this is something you might be interested in, Mr. Betcher. So, uh, detection. So if somebody's trying to Kerberos, uh, if you're setting up a logging environment, uh, so there's a, there's a, a checkbox or something called audit Kerberos service ticket operations. <clears throat> And if you're looking for specific event IDs like 4769, uh, type 17, especially if they're asking for RC4 encryption, I assume RC4 encryption because it's more easily crackable than whatever the default is. So if they're asking Definitely. for, yeah, if they're asking for ter Kerberos tickets with type 17 as the uh, as one of the errors, then you know that it's uh, or as one of the logs, then you know that. Somebody may be trying to do curb roasting on your network. So it's always a good good thing to be looking for or logging for when you're in an environment where it might be hostile. So, Right, as long as you're doing local logging and sending that up to a SIM. Mm -hmm. Or if you can't, at least you do the local logging. And uh, if you need to launch an investigation, it's there for you. Well, okay, here's a question. So let's say I'm a bad guy. What if the first thing I did was turn off logging? Would there be a log event that went to your SIM that said, oh, this, this host has turned off logging? You can set that up, sure. Uh, when someone deletes logs, that is that is a log event as well. Mm, okay. So you can never actually delete that log event. Right. Um, right, because it happens after the log deletion. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. If if anyone deletes logs, you you should know about it right away. Right. Are you are you getting that there there was a log turnover? Does it say oh you know this log was recently cleared or what do you, what kind of error you get there? It was a log clear. Okay. Or it it will be a log clear. Right. So in a normal, that that's abnormal, mm -hmm. right? No one no one does that because in Windows they by default roll. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a stealthier technique would be to create tons of log entries mm -hmm. that way whatever you do is going to roll in no time right however if the target is doing offline logging they're going to get it no matter how many times you delete it mm -hmm. or roll 
Right. Right. So, so uh, I know um, that more sophisticated attackers will figure out what kind of logging is going on on the box. Mm-hmm. And that gives them an idea of what they can do. If, if local logging isn't set at all, then, um, then they can do stuff in this article, dumping creds and all that. Right. But if it is, then, um, that's a problem. You can't do any of this. You can't run Mimi cats. You can't, um, you can't do any Kerber roasting as long as they're right. Doing proper log management, Mm -hmm. uh, that will be detected. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Wow. Yeah. So um, this was some of the stuff I was looking at was from the MITRE website. Where's that? So they said uh, mitigations against Kerber roasting or, or, you know, TGTs or TGSs is ensure strong password length, ideally 25 characters and complexity for service accounts, and that these passwords periodically expire using a group managed service account or other third parties such as password vaulting. Limit service accounts to minimal required privileges. That's very important, uh, including membership and privileged users such as domain admin. And limit Kerberos encryption to AES rather than RC4 where possible. So I guess the default is RC4. I wonder why they haven't deprecated that or made it where it wasn't uh, wasn't a thing. So I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, be something to research. Is it is it just Windows Seven? Um. Do you have to upgrade to 10 or if you have a fully patched Windows 7, does it get rid of RC4? I don't know. Go to something more advanced. I do know that um, Windows 7 is outside of um, no more more security updates are happening for Windows 7 after the first, uh, like, I want to say October or November this time. So, yeah. 2019. Yeah, this year, I think. Yeah, unless you're going to pay a lot of money to to have it fixed. So let me see. I'm trying to find out if there's a way to know what encryption is being used in Windows 7. I assume RC4 is like the the default for everybody. But, um, you know, you'd want to keep it RC4 if you're using a mixed environment because there may be some chances that if you upgraded to AES, then it might lock you out of certain operating systems from being, being used. So... Um, do, 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 do. Hey, um, okay. So, I mean, those are some of the things I learned this week. Um, I've got some more stuff I'm going to, I'm going to learn. Uh, this has kind of spurred me on to get my lab back up and running. I was going to sell that server, but now that I've, I know what's wrong with my password hacking ish pack ha- that password hacking rig, then I can, um, I can go get a decent graphics card and, you know, try, try doing proper password hashing, uh, cracks and, and what have you. So, um, all right, let's see. Oh, did you read about the Docker hub security breach? No. So this, uh, this harkens back to our earlier talks for NPM and all those where we have supply chain issues. Um, so attackers breached Docker Hub and they were able to grab keys and tokens. This is from uh, HelpNet Security. So they um, this was announced on April 29th. Um, they said Docker product the company popular for a virtualization tool bearing the same name suffered a security breach. Um, <clears throat> They say on or about the 25th, they discovered an unauthorized access to a hub database storing a subset of non-financial user data. During a brief period of unauthorized access to the Docker hub database, sensitive data from 190,000 accounts may have been exposed, which is, according to this, less than 5% of their Docker hub users. So usernames, hashed passwords, GitHub, and Bitbucket tokens uh, for Docker auto builds. So they're, they're saying you should change your passwords, uh, you know, re, uh, revolve your, uh, your tokens. And somebody uh, by the name of Ken White on Twitter said that uh, it's actually worse than, than, uh, than they're making it out to be because Docker, you know, you need GitHub integration for a lot of things when you're doing your um, continuous integration. So they said, even if your company doesn't rely on Docker Hub for production, 
If a developer in your organization enables auto builds and linked to GitHub via OAuth for a personal project, that OAuth token is compromised and all GitHub repos that they have access to are vulnerable. Even the private ones, because he actually um, modified it accordingly, he said what started out as a Docker issue is now a GitHub issue. Even if your org doesn't use Docker, if one of your developers used Docker with GitHub in integration, your private repos were potentially exposed. It's amazing how everything gets, you know, complicated and connected together for uh, for for DevOps. All this integration is is not necessarily a good thing in some cases. Right. It kind of leaves you exposed in places you <laughs> didn't realize. Right. And anything using OAuth, I guess, would be uh, vulnerable to this kind of uh, this kind of attack. So, um, yeah. So if you've uh, you know been using Docker Hub or you have your developers using it. Uh, you know, one, don't just be pulling, you know, Docker. We actually found out that Docker is not really moderated much. So you can install, you know, nasty, you know, Debian builds or something with some, you know, back doors in it. And people just install that stuff. They don't, they don't really look or, you know, pay attention. They just do what's necessarily easy in that you know, gives gives people additional access to, to systems. So, um, yeah, if you happen to find but it. But it's inherently secure because it's contained. Is it? It's in the name. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, no, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds nice, uh, you know, but they don't call it Docker Sandbox. They call it Docker Container Hub or Docker Hub. So, um, let me see. Ch -ch -ch. Yeah, that one, that one was a little rough. So, um, let me see. Is there anything else that we wanted to talk about? That, did you have any kind what? of um, uh, malware or anything this week? Anything you've been seeing from the IR side? Uh, nothing I can talk about. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, have you guys just made it so easy to ma to find you know malware and detect malware now that it's no longer exciting, or has there just not been anything of of note well, or anything new? Every once in a while, we'll get one that is supposed to do like root kits and things. Um, a lot of the stuff we get is a dropper, and we try to get the stuff that the dropper drops. Mm -hmm. Right. Because right. people say, hey, I got this cool malware, but it but it ends up being something that installs malware. Mm. So usually they're divided into several phases. And um, certain groups, certain threat groups uh, specialize in uh, getting access to the system and being able to install malware. Mm -hmm. And then they hand it off to another group who then uh specializes in malware which maintains command and control that sort of thing mm -hmm. and then they'll hand it off to another group which further exploits uh the systems sort of a, in a manual fashion I see. Um, that's kind of how the elite hackers or groups or nation states work mm -hmm. so a lot of times when we get what do you call it, iocs it's yeah. it's typically the dropper and uh, then we'll try to go out and find the, the malware that gets dropped. And a lot of times that's gone. It's either a one-time use or it's been taken down by service providers, things like that. So if Amazon finds out about some malware that was hosted on their infrastructure and it's reported, they'll look at it and then usually take it down pretty quick. Right. Right. Okay. So it's it's rare that we get really good ones. A lot of times it's sort of the commodity stuff. So Yep, that's that's our story. And then sometimes we get stuff that's new and exciting, but then we can't talk about it publicly cuz then somebody will find out, "Ooh, um what happened here?" right? Right. Yeah. Nope. That uh that makes sense. So, um Wow, yeah. I guess that's uh you know that's uh important to know that uh you know disclosure can often be your uh, your your own worst enemy. So 
Um, all right. So I, I remembered one other thing that we wanted to talk about and it kind of dovetails from the Docker hub breach. So there's, um, there's a hacker out there wiping GitHub repos and asking for ransom, but, um, he's not exactly destroying the, the data that's on there. So according to ZDNet, uh, Catalan Campanu, uh, May 3rd, uh, he posted this story said hundreds of developers have had Git source repos wiped and replaced with a ransom demand. Uh, started early, attack started earlier today, being May 3rd. Appeared to be a coordinated uh, across Git hosting services and is still unclear why they're happening. So somebody removes all their source code in recent commits, leaves a ransom note behind asking for 0.1 Bitcoin, which at the time was about 600 US dollars. And... Um, so yeah, they said there's hundreds of victims, 392 repos have been ransomed so far. And, uh, some, and they say some users who fell for a victim accounts, uh, to this hacker were using weak passwords and no 2FA. Uh, others, uh, lost, uh, or, or forgot to remove access tokens for old apps they hadn't used for months. So then again, look, we've got, we've got supply chain issues. We've got integration issues. So if you're not removing access tokens for old apps that you've got, um, they say both of which are very common ways in which online accounts get compromised. And so they say all evidence. Can you explain that? Access tokens, old access tokens. What is that? Well, for like uh, GitHub, if you are doing various uh, things with your, your GitHub, like, um, I don't know if you're using uh, you know, AWS integrations or you're using something that the grants an API access token, uh, for, for an old app, um, uh, it will, you know, it, it's used. And if it's there long enough or it's been leaked by something else in this case, then, um, you know, those are, those are old. And if you're not using them anymore, they need to be, they need to go. Cause, uh, um, you know, that's important um, because they get compromised right. that way. So, and, and the weak passwords, what did they just uh, hmm. hammer the system? Uh, do they use uh, password spraying? I mean, how do, how does this, I wonder. My, my guess is, yeah, they're using some kind of password spraying uh, or they're just constantly trying to log in. So that would be, uh, you know, some of them, I don't think they, I think they mentioned they're not, you. they weren't using 2FA either. So there's a, there's a whole big mess of, um, you know, fail on this case, you know, where, you know, some of the things you, like I said, you need to do is put 2FA on your, your GitHub account or have, um, um, what do they call that? Um, they have, uh, they have password ha- uh, values that you can use in case you've forgotten your passwords or what have you. Um, it, break glass kind of items. Um, but yeah. always enable two-factor on your, your GitHub. Um, look over your company or your personal integrations to your GitHub and your, you know, any, any Docker kind of things. So, yeah, if somebody was using uh, Docker Hub integrations, that might have caused some uh, further um, you know, issues there. So, um, yep. yeah, so those are, those are all good things to look at. you know, when you're going in, uh, tomorrow, Monday morning, you might want to put that on your to-do list or have it look over, you know, what we're, what, what, what you're using in your, your CI environment to, um, you know, integrate with GitHub or what have you. So maybe time to get rid of some old, old, uh, integrations. So, all right. Um, Man, I want to talk about Avengers Endgame and Game of Thrones, but <laughs> I can't do it. I, you know, it's no spoiler, no spoiler podcast here. So um, go see Endgame if you haven't, because it's it's fairly decent. So one more thing um, yeah. on the Kerberos thing: it says uh, portions of the Kerberos tickets may be encrypted with the RC4 algorithm. Mm-hmm. So there's some uh, follow up to do. We need to figure out why. Mm-hmm. And what we can do to mitigate that. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Okay. That's uh, why it's the Kerberos tickets. So let's fix those tickets. That's right. If we- Enable AES because it's harder to, you know, harder to crack. It doesn't make it any, you know. Like thousands of times harder. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, you sh- you should be seeing those things across the wire or in your logs with the proper event IDs if you're doing it correctly. Like like we said, what forty seven ninety six or something like that. Where was that? It said Dina. I don't know. I tacked my matrix. Was it forty seven ninety six? Yeah, I think it was forty seven ninety six, and I said so. There's a ton of there's a ton of programs out there though that will will dump your um, dump your data. You know the uh, the ones I mentioned was uh, Power Manager. There's uh, Mimikatz. You can actually just you know dump SAM if you've you know like I said they got systems. So if you can get PS Exec on the system, uh, and you know uh, it was a PS Exec.exe slash dash s space cmd, and it gives you a command prompt with NT system, uh, NT authority system. So once you get that, you're Good to go, I think. So, yeah. All right. Let me see. Um, I don't only really have much. It's going to be a short show this week, in which I'm not not overly unpleased about. So, <laughs> well, we had a we had yeah, a long I mean, one last week. We have a lot of long shows. So, um, you know, I I learned some more things, but I need to you know talk about. We'll we'll talk about them as we go along because I've I would love to do talk about some more of the. Uh, pen testing stuff that I did while we were on there. So I have to figure out what I can and can't say. So, um, oh, one thing I will say as a, as a caveat, make sure all your passwords have admin passwords on them. Don't, or, or all your printers have admin passwords on them because you don't want to be having an environment where people can just attempt to pivot through a printer. So that's all I'm going to say. So, Mr. Betcher. You've got a lot going on right now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? What with, I'm doing. With LogMD and those things. Ah, yes, LogMD. Mm-hmm. We just added a remote, For this is for the pro version, a remote um, access report. Mm-hmm. So if there is a um, an attack or uh, that you think happened, mm-hmm. you can run LogMD on whatever systems and you can see the communication right right whether it be um to command and control through rdp anything like that are you using and so it'd be in a nice tight report uh where you can see the um if anyone communicated with anything using uh, default things what kind of uh, what kind of commands are you using there? Are you using uh, like PowerShell commands? Are you using I mean are you using regular regular Windows commands? What are you looking at for uh, creating this report? We're just looking at the logs. Oh, okay. That's so it. you're just pulling the remote log or the logs remotely. We are pulling the remote access logs. Okay. On the local machines. Oh, very cool. So- okay. All right. Um, and splitting them up into various reports so you can quickly look at them. If you want to look at auto runs, you look there at mm-hmm. the auto run report. Right. If you want to look at PowerShell, there's a PowerShell report. Right. Right on. Um, so uh, you're, this tool is LogMD. Uh, so tell us how people would find out more information about that. Yeah, you can go to the website, log md.com. Cool. To find out tons more okay and uh people wanted to follow you on twitter um where would how would you do that my twitter account is at betcher pwned b-o-e-t-t-c-h-e-r-p-w-n-e-d mm-hmm. cool um so just as a an aside i know some of you are unhappy about not getting tickets to DerbyCon. i apologize for that uh, I managed to get a ticket. I'm going to be there for training. I'm going to take the Python for OS hacking, which looks like a very good um, uh, class, uh, two day class, I think. So I'm going to be in there on the third of September, flying in and staying until the ninth, the following Monday, because I don't want to try to fly out on Sundays like I did before. But um, everybody from Breaksec and uh, the BDIR podcast is going to be there. Michael Goff, uh, he got he got tickets. Uh, Mr. Betcher. Got a ticket through Mr. Goff. Uh, Ms. Berlin's got her black badge she earned last year for the, the mental health village and the stuff she's doing for that. And uh, I've got my training tickets. Everybody's going to be there. It's going to be great for the last uh, Derby Con. So um, you and I have to actually plan out, you know, what what hotel we're going to be staying at and stuff. So, right. Yeah. Um, 
single bed like last time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Twin, twin bed, twin bed. <laughs> Big spoon. Anyway. All right. So, um, yeah, Miss Berlin. Uh, I want my own pillow this time, though. What? <sighs> Wow, you're asking a lot. It's asking a asking a lot. Uh, so Ms. Berlin's doing uh, the Mental Health Hacker Village. Um, I think she's at Hackers Health on Twitter, but you can also find her at Info Sister I N F O S Y S T I R. Uh, Hackers Health, I think, is what it's called. Hackers Health. Yes, Hackers Health on Twitter. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and if you're doing a conference and you're interested in maybe having her come and do the Hackers Health Village or the Mental Health Village, um, you know, hit her up, ask her, uh, ask her to come out. She'll, her or Ms. Roddy will 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 come and do it for you. So, uh, if they if they're available. So, all right. So podcast, uh, you can follow the podcast on Twitter, BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Break, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. Um, yeah, InfoSec Campout, I'm really starting to ramp that up, which, you know, it's in August. And, you know, we, uh, for those of you who live in the Seattle area, we just rented the barn that's at the campsite so that we can have talks that are under the shade and, um, we're doing it a little differently. So most conferences have talks that happen all day from, say, 8 in the morning until, you know, 5 in the afternoon. But because of the timing and everything, we're actually starting talks at 3 in the afternoon and going until 8. So by then it will be uh, heat of the day going on into evening. And um, we're, we're going to have six or seven talks. But during the day from like, you know, nine in the morning until three in the afternoon, we're going to have various workshops. So we're looking for some workshops. We're looking for, you know, something, um, you know, something maybe three, four hours long. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in, uh, you know, doing something, you know, please let us know. We're looking for all kinds of talks as well. So we have a, like a, a disaster recovery talk, which I thought was quite interesting that uh, we don't have a lot of disaster recovery talks. Uh, a lot of them are just, inf you know, disaster, uh, not disaster recovery, but um, incident response or digital forensics or, uh, you know, log and SIM. But this is going to be talking about what happens if, let's say, you lose all communications. So we're going to be talking about uh, satellite communications and that. Uh, we have a, a handshake agreement with somebody to, to do that for us. We are looking for sponsors. So if you're interested in doing sponsors, you can go to bds.podcast and, and uh, at gmail.com and, and you know talk to us about you know sponsoring us. We have different tiers, different levels. Uh, if you're interested, we'll send you a, a Google Doc with the, uh, the the current levels that we have as as is. So um, you know we have a Slack. The BreakSec Slack is is going uh, gangbusters. We're trying to get the CTF club started over again. It started last night. Um, unfortunately, somebody. Um, we had some logistics issues, so nobody showed up. But we're uh, we're trying to get back into that. Uh, Pinkie Pie is going to have talks. We're going to be talking about various methods of, of attacking a system, kind of like what we just talked about today with uh, dumping credentials and hashes using Mimikatz. Uh, you know, doing privilege escalation. He's planning on working out speakers who would come and talk about how you would do various things like, um, you know, Linux privilege escalation or, you know, uh, very simple hour long talks on how to do binaries or something. If you're interested in talking about, uh, you know, pen test or red team and type environment, um, you know, please let us know. The idea would be you, you know, maybe talk about privilege escalation on a, on a Linux box. And then we would go into a vulnerable VM that would teach that concept. So, uh, just something to think about. Um, thank you to our patrons. We just got another patron, uh, the other day. Let me go and pull up my email. I'll find his email or name. So it was Brandon. So Brandon is one of our new patrons. Uh, uh, thank you for being a patron of the podcast. You're helping out with uh, hosting and our Zoom here and our communications and just the time and effort needed to get the podcast out. So we appreciate, uh, appreciate your support, sir. All right. Um, that was it, I think, for Breaking Down Security. Uh, Mr. Betcher, any last words? No last words. Awesome. Okay. Well... All right. Have a great week, everyone. Take care of yourselves because uh, you're the only you you have. And we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.